forgot to ask you before we started. Uh, how do you pronounce your last name? Is it Shry? Yeah, it's Shry. Yeah, you got it right. Rare. Okay. Cool. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I'm here with Josh Shry, the um, creator of the Emerald Podcast. Welcome. Hey, nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, it's a pleasure to speak with you, and I'm kind of hoping to find out a little more about the the man behind the podcast. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've been listening uh, probably close to when it started. I think mm. um, somebody directed me to it because in 2018, I'd done a short documentary on YouTube called The Shamanic Roots of Yoga. Mm. And um, I think, you know, a year or so after you put out a podcast exploring the third book of uh Patanjali's Yoga Sutra uh, and talking about this kind of correlation between yoga and shamanism. Uh, yeah. And somebody was like, hey, this guy's on to it too. You should check him out. Because <laughs> um, I don't know if there's like so many people really going deeply into that um, mm. whole discussion. But uh, yeah, and then I started listening and um, I just uh, found a lot of resonance with the topics you cover. Often it reflects things that I'm exploring at the same time. Uh so yeah, it's uh I feel like a lot of kinship with what you're doing out there. Mm. Thank you uh, and likewise. Yeah, nice. Yeah, it feels good to know that you're not alone and uh wondering about these things, you know. And uh I think, you know, wondering deeply like going into kind of deep study on some of these topics. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a joy through the podcast to realize how many people synchronize and harmonize with this particular way of exploring the world and uh didn't know when i started it i mean i knew that there was probably a growing number of people looking to reconnect to a living world and um explore those deep roots that you're talking about but it's been a joy to see just how many and how that's growing and i think i think it's indicative of like a deep longing that people are feeling in this in this day and age mm -hmm. yeah i'm curious about your background did you um go to university for anthropology or ethnography or religious studies or anything like that yeah so you're honing in on the topic that i talk the least about which is the the man behind the podcast i, I generally like like to talk about you know um, ecology and myth and the natural forces all around around us. And I try to shift the lens away from me a little bit, but I, I mean, I'm happy to share. Um, you know, I'm an interesting case because I actually didn't go to college at all. I, uh, I grew up in practice traditions, so I'm approaching all of this not from the Western academic perspective, but as someone who was raised immersed in, in practice. And so what that looked like is I spent my childhood in a Zen Buddhist community and I lived with my family for a time in India where I got an early deep dive into the Indian mythic traditions and lived at various ashrams and centers there. And this was quite a while ago um, before that was a popular thing to do. <laughs> and um, went from there to study in high school, like in Taoist and Lakota traditions and Tibetan Buddhism in a serious way, Tantra for many years. And so, you know, the exploration when I encountered um, what you could call like the increasing scholarly approach to, to myth, the increasing scholarly approach to understanding it and um, anthropological terms on the one hand, psychological terms on the other hand. Um, my deep feeling, because I don't have a background in Western academia, my deep feeling was that something was missing. And generally what I felt was missing was the actual breath of life itself, <laughs> the actual <laughs> animacy itself, the fact that these aren't abstractions, they're not words that live on a page that are meant to be analyzed, you know, when you look at how myth was historically and is still practiced in certain traditions, um, how it is so intertwined with ritual, so intertwined with felt experience in the body, so intertwined with communal enactment. I wanted to see if I could help, uh, 
you know, rekindle the spark a little bit and provoke people to examine the mythic as a living force that still lives and breathes and has application in our world today and is alive and well and pulsing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's a little bit of how I came to it. Yeah. Well, I can, I can relate to that as well. And that maybe explains some of the resonance I feel with your approach. Um, uh, I, I came to the the deeper study of these things um, through practice as well, like trying to understand the experiences I had in practice mm. um, and trying to understand how to integrate some of those experiences that I've had in shamanic traditions or the yogic tradition with my everyday Western life and psychology. Um, I often felt at times there was a split in me between the uh, side that was um, just in the experience uh, and then the side that would try to explain or analyze the experience. And I saw this as kind of a split between the modern mind and the mythic mind. And mm -hmm. uh, it was really um, depth psychology and the work of people like uh, Hillman, uh, Thomas Moore was really helpful uh, in helping me bridge those kind of two minds or, or mindsets or worldviews. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I come to it through uh, practice as well and was often frustrated when I'd read academic or scholarly work on, you know, like Mercia Iliadi's shamanism. I was like, this guy's never done shamanism before, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it always seemed like a real kind of removed outsider perspective. And uh, I found it quite lacking. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, your parents sound like really interesting people. That's a big difference between us because I come from a, a kind of very secular working class um, background. Uh, but it sounds like your parents were involved in some really interesting things. Like, yeah. who are they or who were who were they? Um, they, uh, you know, in the late 1960s, at a time when many people were seeking, they discovered Zen Buddhism and specifically the teachings of Roshi Philip Kaplow, who uh, wrote a book called The Three Pillars of Zen, which was kind of instrumental in bringing Zen to the United States. And he started a center in upstate New York, and they found it uh, very early on. My mom started practicing probably when she was about 20. Um, and my dad, maybe a little bit older. Um, but they were what you could call like serious spiritual seekers. They were spiritual seekers, you know, before it was popular to be a spiritual seeker, before you could uh, make money being a spiritual seeker, before it was like a career path and Instagrammable career path, right? They they did it to address, um, you know, what they saw to be like a crisis in the world and a crisis in their own lives, and they became practitioners. And so, you know, and <laughs> there were, you know, challenges to that upbringing. They it issued all like material comforts. And so we grew up dirt poor traveling around the world and practicing at various spiritual centers. Um, but there was also just a, a really deep, deep foundation in the, in the power of community and in the power of practice and in the power of study, but not just study as an abstract study is something that is eventually meant to be woven into the tissues and, and embodied and yeah and my dad's been a somatic practitioner for years and years and years and years he does healing work and um, they've been deeply involved in kind of um, alternative visions of you know lineage practice but also alternative visions of health and and wellness um, well before the the wellness craze so if you hear me on the podcast making you know certain editorial commentary about the wellness craze and about marketplace spirituality you know it's because i've been immersed in it in my entire life and i've i've seen the genuine and i've seen what it's become and i saw the original iteration of the new age movement back in the late 1980s and um what that spun out into and um you know uh that's the the place I'm commenting from when I when I comment on what I see going on in the in the spiritual world today. Mm -hmm. yeah. So from uh, the Zen uh, 
I guess you'd call it a monastery in upstate New York, mm -hmm. um, you know, Zen can be so clean and tidy to <laughs> the kind of the messy, chaotic uh, Indian tradition and moving to India. Uh, mm -hmm. What brought that about, that shift? My parents went to Asia um, for an extended period of time to visit all of the holy sites and to study with various teachers. And for me, it came right at that critical age when I was just passing into teenagerhood and waking up to, you know, um, a whole variety of adolescent forces and, you know, at a very initiatory time in one's life. And yeah, all of a sudden my world was blown wide open from the clean monastic halls. Uh, I was just thinking about this yesterday because uh, there was a, uh, article about how like the women's world cup Japan team, like tidy their lockers, like after they play to like the, you know, to, to the point of absolute perfection and everything like that. And I was thinking about, wow, like, you know, I really grew up in this, in this like kind of Japanese practice environment that was so orderly. And then in India that was blown wide open. And I found, you know, it was a, um, explosion of color and light and sound and chanting and um, stories yeah. and animal beings and uh, mythic forces and serpents. And um, it just, as someone who always loved story, because I was raised on it, it just, it just blew my world wide open. I mean, I started studying Tibetan language and Sanskrit that year when we were over there. And, um, yeah, it was a, it was a major transition into a, a larger animate world. And, and India is a place where, um, you know, the animate forces are articulated and interact with, uh, interacted with and spoken about and sung to. And there's a, a rhythm and a pulse of interaction with the animate um, that goes well beyond kind of the vision of just maybe people chanting to abstract deities. It, it, it uh, takes root in village traditions of spirit possession and this kind of thing. And it's something that's very visible and very tangible and very alive and very present. Um, so, you know, in Indian, Indian tradition, there's no there's no doubt about the fact that the myths live in the body and that ultimately there's meant to be some type of practice of embodiment around all these stories. Right. Mm -hmm. So then when I, that really formed the basis of like the somatic way that I view myth, because later when I encountered Greek myth and I saw, you know, the beautiful like psychological work of people like Marie Louise von Franz and this kind of thing, who, you know, analyzed Greek myth from a personal perspective, and then I saw like the classics majors analyzing it from, you know, a whole other perspective. I just felt like something's, something's missing, like something's missing here. There, the, the life breath of practice, this was embodied in practice. All the Greek myths were embodied in ritual practice, right? They were embodied in festivals and ceremonies and um, the gods didn't live far off and away and weren't meant to simply be analyzed or even to be felt as just individual psychological forces right? The gods were interacted with as the living forces of nature. So India, I think at a very young age, really opened my, my eyes and my heart and my skin and my bones to, to that. Mm -hmm. And then moving to the United States, <laughs> I mean, back to the States, I guess, returning yeah. to the States, um, you guys ended up in the Southwest in New Mexico or? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, it's up to you how long we want to talk about my life story, but <laughs> it's funny. I, I don't, you know, I don't usually spend a huge amount of time talking about myself and these types of interviews and I get a little shy about it. Um, yeah, we landed back in the Southwest United States where I went to high school and, um, you know, we came back from India. We ended up in, Bodh Gaya, India at a time when the Dalai Lama was there. And of course this was before, like you could look on the internet and figure out where, what his schedule was and where he was going to be. It was a total surprise that we happened to land there when he did. 
And so I encountered Tibetan Tantra at a very young age, at um, my early teen years. Um, and just, I had an encounter um, with him and his entourage and retinue and like, you know, speaking of kind of a transition from Zen Buddhism, it was just so, it was a Buddhism, but it was such a different Buddhism. It was a Buddhism, you know, Zen Buddhism is steeped in animacy also. There are many, many animate forces at play in Zen Buddhism and Shintoism is alive and well in Zen Buddhism. But in Tibetan Buddhism, it's more like right up front and the practices themselves are engagement with these forces and deities. And it's so colorful and bright and, um, I just felt a heart connection to it immediately. So I practiced and studied Zen Buddhism all throughout high school and into my, or Tibetan Buddhism all throughout high school and into my early twenties. Um, and at the same time, I had a good friend here who was practicing the Lakota path with a Lakota teacher and he was doing sweat lodge ritual. And, um, so we did weekly sweat lodge rituals and studied the Lakota path with, with his teacher. And that was really formative in my animate worldview also. Um, New Mexico is a place where, you know, it's very influenced by um, the Native American traditions that are still deeply, deeply rooted here and deeply rooted, although there's been obviously colonization and all kinds of problems from that. The Pueblos are still deeply rooted on their ancestral land and they still perform the ceremonies that they've been performing for however long. And you can feel that in the land here. Hmm. The land here is, it's honored and it's recognized and it's uh, sung to and um, it's vibrant and alive. And that shaped my animate worldview too. Early experiences I had with the land in New Mexico. I talk about it a little bit in a recent episode, which was called inanimate objects aren't inanimate or objects, right? Mm -hmm. I talk about an experience of being out among the stones and just having no doubt at all that the stones were watching and listening. And anyone who's gotten into the deep desert far enough away from your electronic devices and all the distractions of the world that you can really start to listen. If you start to listen close, you will start to hear something among the stones, you'll, you'll start to hear something. So the land here was a huge influence on, on me, not simply the traditions I studied, though I studied and practiced, um, diligently and regularly, uh, you know, throw in a little teenage psychedelic use and, um, it's a recipe for opening up to a world of, of animacy mm -hmm. and, I think the land here continues to shape and form the the work that I do. Hmm. So not so much uh, a culture shock coming back. You had you kind of found uh, a place where this animate worldview, animate life, could continue and mm. um, be supported by local traditions and and things mm. like that. Yeah. Yeah. And there, you know, Santa Fe is a, I mean, it was a culture shock coming back. <laughs> it was definitely a culture shock because that, that time that we were in India was like the bridge for me between childhood and adolescence really. And so to come back to high school, I mean, I remember drawing like images of Shiva and like Sanskrit lettering and stuff in my high school class while everyone else is like big hair and listening to Metallica and that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was a shock. <laughs> Um, but I found, you know, Santa Fe is a place where, um, you know, these types of traditions have taken root over years and years and years. It's one of the places that spiritual teachers landed very early on in the United States. So there is a Kargu lineage Tibetan practice center out here. And I helped build the stupa when I was 15 years old and helped paint the inside of it and practiced there for, for many years. And, um, good grounding in, in, excuse me, good grounding in practice community. Um, and that really held me during those years when, you know, our family life was kind of disrupted because my parents left the spiritual center that they had been associated with for so long. And, um, you know, 
kind of found themselves in the world with no money and nothing to do and wondering what was next, um, as is right. the case of many people who spend years and years and years in spiritual community and devote their lives to it. Um, and, uh, you know, don't think about things like materiality while they're doing it. You know, when I was 14, 15, and we came back from Asia, um, they were having to reinvent their lives completely. And, uh, what gave me foundation and anchor was practice and community and nature. Those were the mm -hmm. things time, time in the wilderness, Tibetan practice, Lakota practice, uh, the sweat lodge practice was a huge, huge help for me when, when I was a kid taught me how to pray, which I think is, you know, in, in obviously in Buddhist traditions, there are prayers, but it's a different kind of prayer. It's not, steeped in the honey nectars of devotion in the same way yeah. and for me i discovered through the sweat lodge I, I felt it in india when we lived there i felt the bhava i felt the the devotion but the sweat lodge really taught me like how to pray how to ask in that deeply like beautiful tender illuminated state that comes from being in there with the steam and the rocks and having to let go and surrender a little bit. And then the prayers just start flowing. Yeah. Um, it taught me, it taught me a lot about how to, how to pray and how to, how to be in good relation with larger forces. You know, yeah. the larger, the larger forces aren't abstract. Again, the larger forces are real and there are simple, simple ways to feel them and acknowledge them and bring them into our lives. Yeah. yeah. Well, a ritual, that empties you out and kind of uh, thrusts you out onto the precipice will have a way of opening the door of the heart to true authentic prayer. Mm. Yeah. I, I've said the same thing myself, like that sweat lodge taught me how to pray, like mm. the prayer from the heart, not mm. the um, kind of scripted memorized mantra or something, yeah. you know, like, like the plea to yeah. the God or the divine. Um Mm. yeah and like coming out of like the humility you know f that first moment getting on your hands and knees and crawling through the hole uh where everybody's kind of equalized and then everybody's kind of going through it together you know it's incredible ritual and if you're in a really hot one <laughs> i remember uh being in at the reservation the lakota reservation in cheyenne river south dakota uh, we were there for the Sundance and I was 20, I was about to turn 21, 20 years old and came in there. Like I'd been doing sweat lodge for years and came in there kind of like, you know, maybe with a little bit of 20 year old attitude and everything like that. And within five minutes, the water that they poured on the rocks, I was like face down on the ground, like trying to get my mouth to a place where the ground was like cool and I could breathe. And yeah, the prayers came easily that day. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah. but those types of experiences that you're you know that you're talking about like that's essential to ritual you know ritual isn't just scripted performative there's scripted performative aspects of it right that to kind of set the container and everything but there's always some form in traditional ritual of taking us to the edge and that could be as simple as like, oh, the ritual is 12 hours long and you have to sit in one place and it's going to be entirely uncomfortable, right? It can be simple as that discomfort. It could be the like taking to the edge that something like the sweat lodge does. It could be a dance that lasts 36 hours, you know, but there's going to be something that is going to take you to the place where you can't control the situation anymore. And you have to one way or another aligned to something greater, mm -hmm. right? That it's not your strength of will that's going to get you through at that point. It's actually letting that crumble, crumble and, and letting yourself be regrown by larger forces. Yeah. Well, you say letting as if you have some choice in the matter. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can resist for as long as you want, right? You know, yeah. You, can, yeah. you could try to put up a fight. I mean, you know, and, and it reminds me of like entheogenic work, but like you, you can, you can try and resist. 
you try. <laughs> <laughs> but I think like the good uh, like ritual leader will know when to turn up the heat or up the dose or you mm. know uh, turn up the volume on the chants so, and you know to be able to sense when you're you're holding on or you're you know you're full of hubris and you're acting like uh, you've got it all under control. Mm. <laughs> I mean, that might be a good distinction between um, ceremony and ritual, you know, mm. like ceremony being that kind of uh, extroverted form uh, that's scripted and, and done to uphold uh, some aspect of the culture or society, whereas the ritual is more about breaking all that shit down, mm. uh, you know. I don't know if that's an accurate uh, distinction mm. or not, but it kind of makes sense to me. I don't know. Yeah, I think, I mean, I guess it depends on how you define it semantically, but I think that there is a distinction between, um, you know, performative repetition that doesn't take you to the edge and performative repetition that thrusts you into the mystery. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Right. And, and ultimately, I think human beings long for that enacted communal repetitive access to the mystery. I think we long when I was mentioning just earlier, kind of a, you know, a deep longing that we have. I think we long to be broken down. I think we long to have that experience of shattering um, because as we're regrown, we're, we're not regrown alone necessarily we're regrown in alignment to something else and mm. you know traditionally that's communal regrowing um but it's also regrowing to the larger ecology of natural forces and the movement of the seasons and the movement of the celestial bodies and the great cycles and rhythms all around us like we go through life at one pace and rhythm and i have i have to check myself continually throughout my day just to calibrate and say, okay, is the, the pace at which I'm approaching this, is this the natural pace of this day? Is this the pace of what's actually going on around me? Or is this, uh, am I, as they say in, in music terms, ahead of the one, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like you don't want your drummer to be ahead of the one, right? Modern culture is ahead of the one, like modern culture is, is, is rushing to get somewhere. And I think those of us like in this world needs need to constantly recalibrate, constantly recalibrate the the rhythm, the internal rhythms and the communal rhythms to be more in alignment with great rhythms around us. Mm-hmm. Be in the pocket. Yeah, be in the pocket. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you finished <laughs> high school with this uh, really <laughs> unique upbringing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and you have to enter into the world. Mm. You don't hide out in academia, but you've got to <laughs> go out into the world. So how do you start making your living? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't really start making a living until like last year. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> really, seriously, gratitude finally to like be able to work on this stuff full time and feel supported in it. And yeah, deep gratitude for that. I, you know, <laughs> I, um, I mean, you know, my life is an intricate spiral of journeying and wandering and (laughs) and so we can we could talk about it but it would take you know a lot of the time okay well let me be let me be more direct maybe to help you out uh did you start um teaching uh i got the sense from some of your podcasts that you might have taught some yoga along the way oh yeah i taught yoga but that was more recently that was more recently than my uh than those early years so parallel to this track of all of this spiritual practice and spiritual seeking was a deep love of performance and music. Um, Mm -hmm. And those two things traditionally obviously go together. Right. Um, And I didn't know that at the time. And this is an interesting part of the whole journey that I've had to be on is to come to understand like in myself, like the longing for ecstasy, the longing for devotion, the music, the theater, the spiritual practice, these things are all ultimately one urge. This is mm-hmm. one longing, a longing for rapture and a longing for the architecture that allows us to experience rapture. But I didn't know that at the time. So I sought rapture in many, many, many different ways. 
I sought it through spiritual practice. I also went through a time, which I think was deeply important when I got disillusioned with spiritual community. You know, I grew up at a time when like the Osho scene was in full swing up there in Oregon. When I had friends who grew up there, I had friends who grew up in Trungpa's scene in, in, uh, at um, Shambhala. You know, I had friends who grew up in with false gurus who got really screwed up by it. Um, my parents, the community that we lived at was different than those communities. There wasn't things like, you know, abuse and that kind of thing going on there, thank God. Um, but there were politics and my parents got like ousted because of politics. And so I developed, um, as I think is the story, you know, and part of the reason I think I comment on this on the podcast a lot is because I went through the kind of individualist pendulum swing rebound to spiritual community at a very early age. And this was quite a while ago at this point. Like I went through the like, I'm just going to figure it out all for myself. And really, it's all about me. And we don't need hierarchy. And we don't need structure. And we don't need community anyway. Um, I went through that individualistic phase. And again, I think it was deeply important. Um, but it was only until I took kind of the individualism to its like eventual conclusion of loneliness and despair, right, that I finally was able to maybe be regrown into something more balanced between the two sides of the pendulum swing. And I see that struggle at play in the modern spiritual world and the spiritual marketplace immensely. I see a big reaction to the religious on, on one side. And then I think that big relax reaction to the religious takes people into a place where, um, you know, what has been essential for human beings, which is communal architected access to rapture over time, um, gets lost entirely. And when that gets lost entirely, um, people are kind of left to, to wander and then they can think of any old thing and try and sell any old thing. And, and here we are today. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I went through a, a phase where I questioned a lot of it. I still practiced a lot, but I questioned a lot of it. And parallel to that phase, I was involved in music and music production and concert production. And with my love of Tibet and my love of music, I found myself uh, meeting some guys from a band called Beastie Boys. And uh, mm -hmm. I ended up working with the Beastie Boys for seven years, producing their Tibet benefits in the late 90s. And, oh, wow. Hmm. Yeah. Um, this is ancient history for some, but yeah, yeah. it's still Not pretty... <laughs> but it's still pretty cool. If you check out Tibetan Freedom Concert, you'll find yeah. uh, lots of documentary footage and you might even spot me as a young lad running around <laughs> there. Oh, wow. um, what, a, what a great uh, um, meeting of kind of your two worlds in a way, you know, mm. um, that's wonderful. So you yeah, were, uh, it, you're, let's go ahead. Well, and eventually, you know, the podcast is what has helped me crystallize everything, which yeah. is the storytelling, the music, the mythology that I've always loved, the spiritual practice woven into something musical and experiential, mm -hmm. um, you know, that can bring artistry to um, the spiritual inquiry and can bring spiritual inquiry to the artistry and hopefully help create a felt experience around it all. And so I've, like for a very long time, I didn't know how um, like mythology, how storytelling, music, music production, writing on one hand, mythic study, which I've always been completely immersed in, in the middle and um, like spiritual practice and uh, kind of, insight and inquiry into the the state of the the modern spiritual world i had no idea how that like was all going to weave together um and it was really a long slow process to come to an understanding and mm -hmm. really eventually i was just like i just need to story tell i just need to tell stories and see what happens and if you listen to early episodes of the podcast they're not as musical I started mm -hmm. out thinking of it like, you know, on the storytelling side, and then I was like, Hey, I'm working in a music production interface here. 
and and I love music and um, you know I've played with the accompaniment of drone and storytelling and I'm going to try to take this to the next level now I'm going to try to like um, you know over the past four years it's just deepened into the musical um, in, in quite a significant way so yeah <laughs> yeah um thank i mean thanks for teasing all this out of me i you know I, it's not something that i really that have been asked about very much and so uh, i hope it's i hope it's interesting for people and you know. well who cares it's interesting to me and you know i'm the one <laughs> talking to you i mean it it really i mean there's so many parallels in our life L like you like hindsight is 2020 20, right and we understand our lives uh as we like look back at the story and um I look back and go, well, yeah, my spiritual practice started when I was 11 and I picked up the guitar mm -hmm. and got so deeply immersed into it. It was, uh, it was like an initiatory process of like practicing eight hours a day, being completely obsessed, learning how to read another language mm -hmm. and translate that into sound and starting to have uh, really strange dreams, receiving melodies in my dreams and going to my guitar teacher and saying, how do, how do I play this or how do I turn this into a song, you know? Um, and not understanding at the time that had anything to do with um, spiritual life or, or the yearning for, you know, rapture, like, as you say, uh, ecstasy. But getting up on stage and playing, um, feeling that without having words for it, because I didn't grow up in that kind of environment where, you know, words like rapture and ecstasy were, being tossed around i just knew that uh i felt free in those moments like all of my kind of personal history and anxieties and everything were gone in those moments and man once you've tasted that <laughs> it leaves a mark you know right which is um, the classic definition of ecstasy i mean this is yeah ecstasos. Yeah. Ecstasos. yeah 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 um and I, I love, you know, I was wondering, one of the things I was going to ask you based on uh, the growth of the podcast and the way that it's become more kind of production heavy, uh, more considered in that way, is I was going to ask you if you had a background in music production. Um, so it's like, oh, yeah, of course. And mm -hmm. like the podcast is the place where all this comes together, mm -hmm. which is just makes me so happy to hear because it's mm -hmm. the thing in my coaching work that I'm always trying to help people find mm -hmm. is that place where all of their experiences, their history, their interests, their passions, all of that weaves together into a life, mm -hmm. you know, and hopefully a livelihood, you know, if, if, if the gods are, are smiling upon us, it will turn into an actual livelihood where we get some, some payment, right. And we can pay the rent and all that. So it's just, it's great to hear that, that it's worked mm -hmm. out for you in that way. Mm, thank you. Uh, it's, I, I just, I feel a lot of gratitude for like the people who are supporting the podcast and um, the fact that it's resonated and the fact that it's growing. I, I feel really grateful because, you know, I, um, I had a fairly deep struggling, starving artist life for um, quite a long time too. I mean, I worked in the music business to help offset it. Um, but, you know, uh, it was a struggle for many, 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 many years and not knowing, you know, exactly how to weave together um, all of these disparate, in what I thought were disparate interests. You know? mm -hmm. um, It's just been a a real blessing and a and a joy to be able to focus on it and mm -hmm. feel that it's actually resonating and and doing having good effect in the world. Yeah, um, I had the the same feeling at a certain point. Um, my wife and I started doing these circles where we would uh, play music and uh, lead people through a kind of a ritual. Um, like a sound journey ritual and she would bring in some herbal tinctures that she'd been cooking up in the kitchen um, I would bring in songs that I had learned from my different uh, travels uh, and at some point I realized like 
oh, this is where the music and the spiritual practice and the um, creating, like hosting people, all these things that I, I, I have had loved, this is where it all comes together. And it wasn't something that I could have ever projected into the future. Like someday I'm going to bring all these things together and it's going to feel mm. like really integral and, um, and like full and a culmination of all these wanderings. Uh, but it just happened. Yeah. And, and it sounds like that was the case for you. And so one of the things I just want to highlight for people is that um, I think this is the way it is. If you just keep following those threads in your life and, mm -hmm. and kind of keep them alive and keep uh, nurturing them, that at some point things will coalesce. Mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. And, you know, plant medicine really helped me out in that process too, I have to say. Like um, over time, like having clear insight into that which was extraneous and could be kind of stripped away and wasn't really the heart of what I wanted to say or do versus that which was much more aligned with um you know the areas that I put so much focus in um I think I think that for me plant medicine was extremely valuable in that to start to to it's like the little um little places in me that needed pruning were pruned and the places and it's still an ongoing process obviously but the places that you know were areas of potential vegetal growth um but maybe they haven't been treated properly over the years like um Plant medicine has a way, I think, if we work with it properly, um, it has a way of really starting to repattern and, and regrow the individual along their strengths. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that I've found incredibly valuable about it. So I just wanted to say that because it's definitely been an integral part of the process too. And um, like you're saying, I think, you know, I mean, sometimes they're like, people who come up to me and they're saying like, wow, this really feels like kind of a new art form, right? Like the way that you're doing podcasting with like musical storytelling and this kind of thing. And I didn't set out in any way to like start a new art form. And I actually don't think it's a new art form. I think it's a reconnection to something much older and, and bardic, which is the way that stories were traditionally told, right? With musical accompaniment. Um, but for a lot of the only reason I'm saying this is that for a lot of artists, I think, I think we're in an era where we need cracking open of the existing art forms. I mean, mm -hmm. I've talked, I've talked about this on the podcast, like when rock and roll first came, right. Rock and roll caused riots, like rock and roll called caused people to lose their minds and, you know, throw their undergarments on stage. <laughs> and like, you know, it sent people into ecstatic states. It upended social orders, this kind of thing. Now you hear all those like classic rock songs when you're, you know, at Target and it's playing on the, like yeah. the, 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 the shopping network soundtrack and this kind of stuff. It, it in its recognizable familiar form, right, has lost a lot of its transinduction capability, um, a lot of its ability to launch people into ecstasy and rapture. So I think that we're at a time when we like if if the individual artist's fear is like, I'm doing this thing, but I don't really know if, you know, anyone else is doing it. And it's kind of weird. It's kind of like, um, you know, uh, I'm thinking about these incredibly innovative singers like Snow Raven and Vimy and people like this. Um, you know, I think we need people breaking the mold of existing art forms and saying, okay, like if the norm has been a three minute song, let's do a 90 minute song. Like if the norm has been, um, to tell a story in this way, like, you know, who says you can't put scholarly quotes with uh, drone music underneath them and turn them into some type of visceral experience, right? Which is what I'm trying to do. It's like, who says that you can't um, mix influences in order to crack something open into new possible artistic realities that um, take people into spaces that they'd never imagined before. And, you know, for me, it's like, um, in an age uh, 
you know, there we are inundated with the written word, the digital written word, the printed written word, but mostly the digital written word. And I appreciate the written word and I admire it, right? But I think that because of the absolute deluge, the informational flood of writing, right? I think we need something more direct, more visceral. I think we need to um, get back to the promise of the bard, which is the the promise of um, acoustic entry into uh, altered states where we can really feel the story and feel it into our bones. So I encourage anyone who's listening, who's like, how do I weave these things together? Weave, the, weave them together. A mm -hmm. podcast, quote unquote, is like you with a blank slate and you can put as many layers and textures and you know, I was talking to someone over the other day and they were like, yeah, we're probably going to start hearing like knockoff Emerald style <laughs> podcast soon. And I'm like, great, do it, do it. Like, mm -hmm. you know, find those blank slates that allow us to take all of those varied textured threads and weave them into something unpredictable and new and unexpected or unpredictable and re-emergent and unexpected. Yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, the, that people think that the Emerald is breaking new ground just, I mean, shows uh, maybe that they haven't been exposed to anything like that, but maybe it's because I grew up in Canada with the CBC and these mm. uh, very elaborate uh, radio productions. Oh, cool, that, yeah. Uh, yeah, that would have commentary, interview, um, uh, quotes, you know, all woven together with, with music and things like that. So for me, I just thought, oh yeah, this feels familiar, but it's mm. uh, it's covering topics that I'm really interested in that I I, um, I don't hear enough about. So. Yeah. And there was like a time period where that kind of radio format, I think was really being explored well. And obviously when you make everyone a podcaster, then all of a sudden, <laughs> like, you know, a lot of the podcasts out there are unedited, just people talking and, and, and no sound editing whatsoever. And those can be great too. I listen to conversational podcasts too. I'm reminded actually, this is a like memory coming out of this conversation, but I'm reminded of when I was like about um, 11, 12 years old, I, I listened to a whole fictional um like it was on cassette tape series called like the fourth tower of inverness um and it had like all these multiple voices on it and music mm -hmm. underneath it and everything and i remember it's funny i hadn't thought about this in years i went home with my little cassette recorder um and started to i added on to the story so i started to tell that story and then like the, I didn't even have a four track recorder. So I had two cassette recorders. So one of them was playing music while I was talking. And so that was what I was using to, to mix it. But I was like talking over music and storytelling to it. And <laughs> like, I hadn't thought of that in all these years, like creating the podcast and everything. I hadn't thought of that in many, many years. Um, so I think like in that audio book, format in that storytelling radio format there is a lot of precedent for um that type of musical storytelling and it's actually it's something i'm going to ex be exploring a lot more because i'm going to be launching a fiction series of original fiction that's told in this bardic musical way um mm. and that's coming within the next few months i would say we'll see <laughs> <laughs> one man show yeah I mean. <laughs> um well you know that's really interesting i mean that is just another case like you um adding on to this existing like radio player whatever it was and bouncing tracks to a cassette mm -hmm. recorder i mean that to me is just more evidence for hillman's idea of the acorn you know which he got mm -hmm. from uh, the neoplatonists and all that but like the the pattern was already there and mm. it just took you like 40 years to totally. get aligned to the pattern or something you know yeah and the thing that happened with me and you know if we're i guess you know we're talking a lot of personal story today um but the thing that happened with me is i went down a, a writing rabbit hole 
for quite a while. Um, and obviously I still write a lot because the podcast episodes have, you know, a good amount of writing to them, but I went down a writing rabbit hole in, in which I decided that I wanted to focus a lot of my creative energy on like getting published in this kind of thing. Hmm. And it took me a long time to realize like, you know, that, that acorn, that pattern was like the, 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 for me anyway, the, um, that I tended to write rhythmically and I tended to write in a way that was really ultimately meant to be spoken. Mm -hmm. And that like people coming from a literary background weren't attuned to the style I was writing in. They called it repetitive quite often. And if you listen to the podcast, you'll hear that I repeat myself quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's interesting because in all of the bardic traditions, things are repeated a lot and they're repeated yeah, a lot. Because it's, for... it's oral and yeah, it's done for emphasis and also for retention, I think. Right, right? for retention mm -hmm. and also not just emphasis, but it's really how like, the vibration starts to grow. Yeah. It's like mantric like, as well. Yeah. 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 And so it took me a long time to realize that my strengths <laughs> were not necessarily in the abstract written word. They were in yeah. the direct sonic transmission. Right. Yeah. And, and I think this is interesting in terms of the overall subject matter that the podcast tackles, because really what I'm seeking to inspire in people is like, and again, don't get me wrong. Written words are great. I love, I love a good book. Right. <laughs> as you Obviously, can, yeah. <laughs> as you can tell by, by looking behind me, and this is just my office stash for episodes that I'm working on, not my my home library. But like, there is a profound difference between the word that is a symbol for something else that you then visualize or think of when you, um, uh, you know, look at a page, and the written word as a living breath force sonic reverberance that leaves a person's mouth and travels through the air and vibrates the tiny little mechanisms in their ear and then travels as neural salts into the brain and right that resonance is is it's not replicable by anything else there's a power to the spoken word that's not replicable by anything else and it took me you know i started out on that road um and then it took me a whole <laughs> middle like period you, yeah. Well, you talked about your life as a spiral, right? Yeah, I mean, it took me a so whole often spiral. It is. Totally. To yeah. realize that that's where I needed to focus. Oh, that's great. I was going to ask you about writing, like, <clears throat> um, why choose podcasts as the format? Because obviously, yes, yeah, so much of the what goes into the podcast is writing. I mean, you, you write out the scripts before you read them. Um, that's really clear. Uh, and so I was going to ask, like, well, why did, did you ever think about publishing books and that kind of thing? And you've just answered that. Uh, and it makes total sense based on your sp spiral journey. Yeah. Yeah, I did. And I went through kind of a, you know, <laughs> like typically frustrating experience with the, the dinosaur that is the book publishing industry, you know. Mm -hmm. and um, And it was that that helped me realize, like, Oh, what I'm writing is to be orally spoken. What I'm writing is to be said out loud. The way that I'm writing it, it's it's to be said out loud. Um, and I have a process with the actual podcasts where I spend time out in the wilderness and I get myself into what I would call like a conjunctive state. And in that conjunctive state, I start spontaneously uttering words um you know whether they arrive on the breeze or they arrive through the voice of the water um or they arrive through the buzz of the insects i don't know um but i start um uttering words and then from the words come refrains and then from refrains come ideas that i want to tease out into larger so the whole revolution will not be psychologized and animism is normative consciousness and trauma and vegetation gods like all of this came from speaking out in the woods and mm -hmm. a, a practice of spontaneous utterance out in the woods and then that gives me a core that i want to write around and then I, I write around that core and then um in the actual process of recording i also leave open space for spontaneous journeying so if you if you like if you notice in the podcast it kind of sticks to a format for a little while 
And then like one word will kind of open a door and then I'll use that as a way to um, go off into a poetic journey that takes that like hooks the listener in and, and takes them into the actual felt experience of that topic. And a lot of, a lot of that arises spontaneously. So it's a combination of scripted and, and spontaneous utterance, I would say. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I'm just noticing the time and I know uh, we're coming up on the end. Uh, yeah, there's a lot more. <laughs> we haven't even started stuff. talking about the actual subject matter. <laughs> I know we could leave that for another time. Cause yeah. definitely uh revolution will not be psychologized, which yeah. Now that you explain, um, how sometimes these things come through as spontaneous utterances, like, you know, it, it uh, it echoes Gil Scott Heron's revolution will not be televised. Right. And, I love those kind of word plays. Um, mm. They they carry a, a kind of uh, an impact um, because of the the history of those words being combined and just mm. doing like a little remix of a of a phrase like that. I think carries more potency and will grab people's attention and maybe arrest them, you know, stop mm. them in their tracks. Um, I well before we go, like yeah, we could go off, but I would. That's one thing I would like to talk to you about is this kind of psychologization yeah. of uh, spiritual culture and healing culture and all of that. It's a topic yeah. I've been treading. Um, also, we could really go into a deep dive on the shamanic roots of yoga because uh, mm. I'm still just. It amazes me every day when I practice to feel those resonances. And mm. but because we're short on time, I want to ask you, what are you working on now? Like what's kind of captured your interest right now? I'm doing a few episodes right now. I'm doing an episode. Well, I'm, I'm going to release an episode, an interview with a musician named Trevor Hall. And, oh, yeah. um, and he and I talk about sound and vibration and I use it as kind of a launching point to talk about sound and vibration and to mix his music in with it. So that's coming. I'm working on um, an episode called Guardians and Protectors, and it's all about the importance of guardianship practices and traditional animism and how those often get stripped away in, uh, in modern reclamations of, of animist practice and spiritual practice. So if we look at, you know, really most traditions that I've encountered, most practice traditions, from the smallest hunter gatherer societies to, you know, large scale Hinduism and this kind of thing, you see that, um, you see that guardianship is an essential element of it and understanding that there are forces you want to invite in and forces you want to keep out is a huge part of ritual. And so it's talking about how and why that discernment has been lost and how to recapture it a little bit. Mm. Um, and then I'm doing an episode called For the Intuitives, which is about the pathologization of intuition, the prevalence of premonition experiences and how uh, people like Freud basically othered, othered premonition experiences, but how really they're absolutely commonplace. And there's a reason that pretty much every culture in the world has um, mantic seers of some kind or another and how in the absence of a context for the intuitive to live like intuition gets pathologized and then intuition gets also freed from accountability so we get the kind of charlatans in the spiritual marketplace saying that like whatever they feel is absolute truth and that kind of thing so it's about you could say the kind of um fractured history of our relationship with intuition vision and uh um, premonition and this type of thing and maybe how to take a more holistic approach to it. So those two episodes are coming up. Um, nice. and there's more, <laughs> my episodes are, I mean, if I were to do all the episodes that I have mapped right now, it's probably gonna take the next three years. <laughs> so, so there's, there's those, and then there's, there's more too. Yeah. And you mentioned the, the fictional project now is this yeah. fiction that you're writing or are you sourcing yep. it from other writers? Yeah, no, it's fiction that I've been developing over the last 10 years or so. Yeah. Huh. It's a way to deepen into the mythic, um, you know, without the constraints of the scholarly. Yeah. Uh, it's a way, it's a, it's a, it's a world that revolves around song, song and invocation and what that really means, like on a deeply, deeply granular level. 
Um, and I have some wonderful musicians that I'm working with to help bring it to life. And mm-hmm. mm. so that's, that's happening too. Yeah. Great. Well, maybe this will um, satiate my longing for more of what I call uh, shamanic novels. Like, this is exactly what that, that's exactly what this is. Yes. Right. And it's not going to be written. It's going to be written uh, in, or it, you know, it is parts of it are written. <laughs> it's written in a way that, um, you know, it's not the standard trajectory of a literary novel. It's much more like a, um, a Homeric poem that's meant to be like, uh, right. you know, read to music and that kind of thing, interwoven with like paragraphs that are like, you know, recognizably literary. And yeah, it's, I'm, I'm interested in exploring the boundaries of what musical storytelling could look like. That's really mm-hmm. like, you know, there's some people who are doing it. And like you said, those radio shows are, are really an interesting foundation. And, and I'm interested in exploring the boundaries of like, what, what could be next with uh, musical storytelling. Yeah. Well, dude, if you're ever up in BC again, I mean, let's do it live. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Uh, curious, a book I just reread that, uh, it is really um, one of those shamanic novels that really draws you into a world, um, completely immerses you in it, and spits you out on the other side, transformed in some way. It's mm-hmm. uh, the the kin of Atta are waiting for you by Dorothy Bryant. Have, mm. have you read it? It's just funny because I saw you post about it the other day, and I read it when I was like eighteen years old. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember the influence it had on me, but I couldn't tell you anything about the story right now. Oh, yeah. um, other than like somebody goes to another world, right? But I remember how deeply it affected me when I was 18. And it actually probably opened up some, you know, inquiry and access to, to other worlds because I remember being really moved by it. But I only read it once, unlike, you know, things like The Lord of the Rings, which I read over and over and over again. Um, I only read it once, so I don't remember the story. Mm-hmm. I also wanted to say that, you know, one of your posts, uh, like influenced the whole revolution will not be psychologized episode for sure. Like I, you post mm-hmm. about Hillman a lot. And, uh, um, there were a couple quotes that you posted from Hillman that I ended up using in the episode. And so I've definitely monitored your work and felt resonance with it. And I like how you, um, you know, how you see Hillman and his position in terms of this bridge between the the mythic and the psychological. Hmm. Oh, nice. Um, another author you might be interested in, I think he only wrote, well, yeah, he wrote two books because he wrote a book on Castaneda, but uh, the book I'm thinking of in terms of um, the role of uh, the shamanic novel uh, is Daniel, um, Daniel Noel. Mm. And he wrote a book called The Soul of Shamanism mm. that uh, really hard to find. Nobody paid much attention to it except Thomas Moore, who's one of my mentors. Um, mm. But definitely a book I think you would appreciate where he goes. And then it was like he set the groundwork for something and then nobody did anything with it. Mm. And so one of the things I've thought about um, my work doing is um, carrying on what he had seeded and you know also what like hillman had seeded he was influenced by hillman and knew him um and so just carrying that work on because i think there's something really fertile and uh absolutely necessary for us in what these guys were starting to do and what Mm -hmm. people like dorothy bryant was doing back in the 70s like an author who's been totally swept under the carpet and forgotten Mm -hmm. about but so that's one of the reasons why i'm kind of shouting from the rooftops like Go find this book, read it. Um, and I'm going to read her other stuff too, but it's also quite hard to find. Yeah. I, when I was, you know, immersed in writing, um, I had a literary agent at that time and I was talking to him about how there needs to be a category called like visionary fiction. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's kind of what you're talking about that, you know, mm-hmm. fantasy, um, there are wonderful fantasy books out there. There, you know, um, Octavia Butler and, um, you know, there's many incredible fantasy writers, but 
what we call fantasy isn't just about creating fantastical realms, right? Like Tolkien got lumped in the category of fantasy, but what Tolkien was describing was actually a primer for understanding an animate universe mm -hmm. and fiction that goes much more into the actual mythic energetics at play. Um, I think, I think it's time to blow that wide open. And uh, yeah, well, I think like um, some these books like this are, are portals into an animistic uh, mythic mind in a mm. way, because I think it alters your mind. They are mm. psychedelic or they can be. Um, and it, because it requires your absolute concentration and your patience uh, I could listen to the Emerald and be doing, you know, a bunch of other things, but to, to read a book on the page requires all of your focus. And there's something about that, the discipline required to read something on the printed page. So mm. I think like for me, novels have been um, particularly these kind of visionary or shamanic novels are a way to actually restructure the brain and open us into an animistic mythic mind. Uh, yeah, because yeah. You're, you're getting it from the inside out, right? It's not from the the kind of looking at different cultures and traditions and that kind of thing from the outside, but it's entering you into the body of uh, a protagonist who's having all these experiences and you have those experiences with them and there's nothing like it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's certain episodes of the Emerald I don't recommend that you listen to while driving because <laughs> they're pretty lull inducing. Right. But there's actually, there's a type of practice one can do with reading where you kind of open up those sensory gates, open up those perceptive gates and read like one of these types of books that you're talking about, a book like Lord of the Rings or a, a, a book like that. And the, the, the paragraphs can start certain lines, certain sense, sentences can, can start to transmit, mm -hmm. um, just an invitation to people who might be listen, listening to check this out that like, there are certain lines of Tolkien, you can feel like he went there. You can, you can feel that, like you can feel, oh, he went there and he's talking and this is like the place that the storyteller ultimately wants to go right if the storyteller wants to take people on a journey then the storyteller needs to go to the places that they're describing right mm -hmm. to go there to travel there to be in that state and see that like to go into the myth of semele and to feel as she's reduced to ash to feel it right so there's like tolkien there are lines that literally leap out of the page they transmit a particular energy it's something to look for you know books are interesting i in the episode on inanimate objects i wanted to go into books but it was already the longest episode i had done to to date and so i didn't get there um but if, if you look at like traditions where people are like you know touched with the bible on their head and that kind of thing and and that same type of transmission can happen in tibetan traditions and um, if there are, you know, there are ayahuasca traditions and in, in which, uh, like the, the, I know that in some Peruvian ayahuasca traditions, the Bible, the name of the Bible is used as like an energetic force to bring into like that particular field because the, the book has a power to it. Right. Um, in the Hebrew traditions, right, they said that the Torah was written 974 generations before the creation of the earth. <laughs> That's just a, like an interesting thing to feel into, right? And it was written of black fire and white fire, right? Books have an energy to them. Not all books, <laughs> not, not all books, but books can be a portal and books can be animate beings themselves in their own, in their own way. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at in a way that there's, there's an animacy to books and books can transport us into those animate dimensions. Mm. Oh yes. It's so delicious. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great, man. It's been really, really great to talk to you. Um, I hope we can do it again sometime. Mm. Yeah. I'd love to. Um, good conversation and um, you know, 
just starting to get into the the interesting stuff. So, and you know, and I, I appreciate the personal questions. I, I hope that it's interesting, you know, for folks. It's definitely been a good conversation, as far as I'm concerned. And and uh, yeah, I would love to to come back and talk more. Yeah, great. And we won't focus on you so much, but I, I think it's uh, you know, I think it's something that people are interested in. I'm I'm interested in it. You know, mm. where does this come from? Who is this person? Um, and because it also tells a story of how to um how to follow those threads and mm -hmm. trust that at some point things are going to come together for you mm -hmm. and not to you can't rush it you'll just keep mm -hmm. spiraling and it, when it, the time is right things will happen i, I mm -hmm. think that's like an important takeaway from this too like absolutely I, yeah yeah absolutely it's um you know and those threads don't always fall neatly into the categories of modern compartmentalization. <laughs> oh, hell and no. I, <laughs> and I think for a long time, I yeah. expected them to, I, I, like I said, I didn't see the connection between music, theater, spirituality, like myth, all this stuff. Right. And then the connections right there, when you understand like the ancient Greek roots of theater, you understand that it is storytelling, it is musical, it is enactment, it is ritual, it is rapture, it is all these things, right? Well, um, you so understand the role of the the shaman. I mean, yeah. performer, magician, musician, uh, doctor, mm. priest, uh, you know. Right. Yeah. It's not like the doctors live over here and the artists live over here. Yeah. And the visionaries live over here and the scientists live over here. Right. And that's, well, that's one of like the things that Alan Moore talks about is at some point, um, all of those uh, traditions, practices, ologies were all together, usually in one person. And then mm. modernism just started to break things apart and silo things. Uh, now we're just completely fractured and learning how to like maybe put things back together again. But it's interesting. Process. Totally. And it's interesting because like yesterday I released an episode on AI and yesterday I had a talk with about a hundred technologists and talked completely from the spiritual and mythic dimensions of AI and, and it was really well received. And so to me, I think in this age right now, there is a longing for some of those compartmentalizations to be broken down. I think people yeah. see more that um, it can't, sustain that way and that if we're going to solve some of the problems address some of the issues and live an inspired life that we need to break those categories down yeah and look people it's not too late it's only been a few hundred years at most right yeah. and for the rest of 99 percent of humanity it hasn't been like that so we can we can go back mm. <laughs> you know we can undo <laughs> yeah we can undo we can undo uh yeah, it's good not to um, dwell in the anthropocenic narrative that we're in control of everything and this is how it's always been and this is how it's always going to be, mm -hmm. right? It's a great mystery and the way that that great mystery starts to get unraveled is through art. It gets unraveled through the exploration of the visionary artist, shaman, doctor, um, and that has a healing effect on community and on the planet right on thanks josh yeah good conversation happy to yeah. be here take yeah. care my friend bye-bye